I mean, I do cervical transfer animals in rare cases, and I'll use a, 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 a Epimed needle. It's a blunt tip, a 25 gauge through a catheter. But I don't think it it's 100% safe. And again, the artery get, is getting fixed with the nerve there, and you could puncture it or, or hit. I mean, you could have atherosclerosis in it. You could knock off a clot. And as far as posterior superior, yeah, I'm sure it's safer. But then you're gonna to have to go AP lateral, AP lateral. I mean, you have to be really careful where you are. Uh, make sure to stay posterior. So again, I just feel like it's easier to do inferior. But yeah, it's still safer, no doubt about it. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Laser. Uh, and this is a nice segue to the next uh, lecture and final lecture of this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Kenneth Candido will present controversies in particular and non-particular steroid. Uh, his reputation precedes him. Uh, he's a well-known pain physician and has been on the forefront of pain medicine for a long time. Dr. Candido is uh, board certified uh, and has led uh, the affairs of Advocate Illinois Medical Center, um, excuse me, Advocate Illinois Masonic Medical Center since 2007 in the field of pain management. He's a graduate and resident at uh, New York Medical College, and he completed his residency in pain and his pain fellowship at the University of Illinois Chicago. Thank you, Dr. Candido. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for staying late in the afternoon. I think we, we've gone a little bit over time, and I'll try to go as expeditiously as possible. But Dr. Glazer really set the table for what's about to come, and he did uh, give us an inkling about this controversy. Once upon a time in America, that's really what we're talking about, there was an issue related to the controversy of the use of the types of steroids that we inject into our patients. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of how we got there because you really have to understand why we use steroids. This is a reflexive type of conditioning that we've all been uh, inundated with in our daily activities and in our training. Everybody in the room has injected a patient with steroids. We do that on a regular routine basis. But we really don't know why we're doing it. When I go around and ask individuals, it's actually very sobering to see the lack of appreciation of the underlying concepts uh, behind why we inject steroids. I have no disclosures whatsoever related to this educational activity. We're gonna talk about particulate versus non-particulate steroids. Actually, a particulate steroid is actually an insoluble steroid. That's the appropriate designation, whereas a non-particulate steroid is actually soluble to a certain extent. Let's talk about certain injections throughout the neuraxis. Why do we use steroids? All steroids, and I'm talking about everything, whether you're Barry Bonds injecting an anabolic steroid or you're injecting your patient with methylprednisolone, all steroids are four-membered ring structures, and they all are derived from a common compound, which is cholesterol. So every steroid in the body Every steroid, natural or otherwise, has the same four-membered ring designation. Now, if you look at the adrenal gland, there are, there are three major layers, the glomerulosa, the fasciculata, and the reticulata. And all the steroids that we consider useful for managing inflammatory conditions are those from the zona fasciculata. Now, if you look at the common metabolic pathway for steroids that are naturally occurring, they all pass through 17-hydroxyprogesterone, and through that pathway, male or female, they end up being either into the glucocorticoid pathway or the androgenic pathway. We're concerning ourselves with glucocorticoids here, not androgens and not mineralocorticoids, which have other diverse uses that we're all intimately familiar with. So why do we use steroids? The vast majority of low back pain conditions, with or without a radicular feature, are actually muscular in nature. Very, very few are actually coming from bony pathology and fewer still come from the intervertebral discs. The history is fascinating. It goes back 85 years to New England where Mixter and Barr did cadaveric dissections on individuals who had died but who had had low back and leg pain. And they published their findings in the New England Surgical Society Journal stating that the radiculopathy, radiating pain along the spinal nerve, was actually due to mechanical compression, and they were markedly wrong in their assumptions 85 years ago, as we would expect. They also understood that surgical results for radiculopathy were usually less than satisfactory. Well, their premise was that a herniated disc 
was really a chondroma. What is a chondroma? Chondroma is a benign cartilaginous tumor. So Mixter and Barr in New England, when they published their findings after these cadaveric dissections said, well, the reason why people have back pain and leg pain is because the disc forms actually a cartilaginous tumor. We know that to be wrong. We know that the disc has seven chemicals which mediate inflammation, and those are histamine, lactate, bradykinin, substance P, calcitonin, gene-related peptide, vasoactive intestinal peptide, and phospholipase A2. And so why do we know that, in fact, this is not a mechanical process primarily? Because we know that an asymptomatic individual, all of us in this room sitting very comfortably, the hundreds of us who are here late in the afternoon, we're not having any pain, or at least I don't see anybody squirming and, and nobody's grimacing here in the room. Nobody's asking me for Norco prescriptions. See me after the break. But you can see that a vast majority of individuals who have herniated discs have no symptoms whatsoever, whether they're patients, whether this is found in post-mortem examinations, or whether we see this in volunteers subjecting themselves to MRI studies. Why is that? Because everybody has a disc protrusion or bulge, but the vast majority of these re uh, go on to resolution without any intervention whatsoever, unless, of course, it's a recurrent condition or there's extruded disc material. And so the indications for surgical intervention, going back to Mixter and Barr 85 years ago, 1934, we know they're actually quite limited. Acute sciatica, massive disc rupture, loss of neurological function, bladder or bowel dysfunction, or of course something like cauda equina syndrome. And so we know that the pain from so-called sciatica is not due to mechanical compression in the vast majority of patients. It's actually due to irritation of the nerve root, inflammation, and vascular compromise. So phospholipase A2 is one of the major chemicals that we find inside the intervertebral disc. Remember, we have histamine, lactate, bradykinin, substance P, calcitonin, gene-related peptide, vasoactive intestinal peptide, and PLA, a, a phospholipase A2. How do we know that? Well, the Saul brothers actually linked phospholipase A2. They are physiatrists practicing in San Francisco for my physiatry of brothers and sisters here in this room. They do have a, a, a lengthy history of identifying this compound, PLA2, as being the inflammatory compound most notably implicated in, in radiculopathic pain features, which is unique and actually quite fortuitous for us because steroids are the neutralizer of phospholipase A2. So that's one of the rationales for why we use steroid medications. Phospholipase A2 is the inflammatory mediator of the arachidonic acid metabolic pathway. And we know this in humans, but we also know this from animal studies, most notably from McCarran and Allmarker. So McCarran took a group of dogs and injected into their spinal canal, into their spinal uh, intrathecal space actually, autologous nuclear material. He took out a nuclear disc and then he macerated it, injected it back into the animals, and then they, they sacrificed the animals and found severe inflammation in the dural sac, the spinal cord, and the nerve roots. And in controlled animals, there was no inflammation. Olmarker took the study a step further a few years later in pigs and did a similar project where they took autologous nuclear material, they macerated it in a mortar and pestle, put it back inside the epidural space, and they found severe inflammation. But they also saw, in addition to severe inflammation, they saw a reduction in nerve conduction velocity, which was very interesting. And they could reverse this nerve conduction velocity deficiency by the intravenous injection of methylprednisolone acetate. But it was important as to the timing of these injections, whether or not the dogs, I mean, sorry, the pigs actually recovered their nerve conduction velocity function. So if you gave the methylprednisolone rapidly within five minutes or 24 hours, there was almost a complete resolution of the inflammatory process and a, re and a return towards normalcy of the nerve conduction velocity. If you waited, the results were less dramatic. And that's something we should all consider when we have pain patients who present to us with acute uh, compromise or radiculopathic pain features, possibly due to this inflammatory condition. And so we know that we have high levels of phospholipase A2 in disc herniations, whether it's contained or extruded, but highest levels, of course, are in extruded discs. We also have leukotriene B4 and thromboxane B2 found in these non-contained discs. Now, what are those? chemicals. Well, they're part of the arachidonic acid metabolic pathway from the cyclooxygenase pathway gives us thromboxane, and the lipoxygenase pathway gives us leukotriene. So these are the, the chemical mediators of inflammation that we contend with in our daily practices of managing patients with 
radicular low back pain. And so steroids prevent the action of phospholipase A2 primarily on cell membranes. They prevent or reduce the reduction and release of arachidonic acid. They prevent or reduce the production of prostaglandins and the inflammatory response. And so the rationale for why we inject steroids, whether they're particulate or not particulate, insoluble or soluble, is to reduce inflammation by inhibiting phospholipase A2 and by blocking C fibers, so there's an anti-nociceptive effect. If you look at the relative potency of steroids, we measure this by their systemic effects. We don't really measure potency and how these drugs work in the epidural space, or for that matter, intrathecally. And so if you look at a drug like dexamethasone, sodium phosphate, which is a non-particulate or a soluble steroid, you'll see it's about five times more potent than is methylprednisolone acetate, and that's something that we haven't really thought about much, really. If you give these drugs systemically, Decadron is actually more potent than Depometrol. However, it doesn't last very long, and Dr. Glazer pointed this out very appropriately. And so, how do we know what the chemical properties are of a steroid based upon its name? Well, if a drug ends in L-O-N-E, like methylprednisolone or triamcinolone, those are long-acting steroids. Those are depot preparations. They're long-acting, but they're also insoluble. They have particles. If a drug ends in S-O-N-E, such as betamethasone or dexamethasone, that's a short-acting steroid. It's also a soluble, a relatively non-particulate steroid. So L-O-N-E, long-acting but particles. S-O-N-E, short-acting, no particles. And so we have to give a great deal of credit to some of the people who really took heroic steps, and that includes Dr. Glazer, who published his own study where he's had a patient who was paralyzed from an epidural injection, but also Rick Tizo in New York. And so in 2003, Rick Tizo was doing a cervical transferaminal injection and paralyzed the patient. But rather than go and hide in a corner, Dr. Tizo, this is Dr. Tizo right there, this is a P&I last year at the New York, New Jersey SIP meeting. Dr. Tizo went back and said, you know what, what the heck happened here? And he took all the steroids which were commercially available and he studied them using scanning photon electron microscopy to see the size of the particles. And he said, okay, I see Depomedrol's got large particles, triamcinolone's got large particles, but not as large as Depomedrol. And lo and behold, betamethasone and dexamethasone have virtually no particles. And if you look at the size of an artery to a metarterial, to an arterial, to a capillary, you realize that particle size is very important if we're thinking about thrombotic or embolic phenomena, which could lead to paralysis and could lead to death. And there's Tizo again, great guy very heroic guy, just as Dr. Glazer, to go out and, and show the world, rather than run and hide, look, we had this issue, we had this complication, what the heck happened here? So let's look at the commercially available preparations that we see in common clinical practice. How many folks in the audience use Depomedrol for epidural steroid injections? How many use Depomedrol for transforaminal injections? Just three of us are honest or telling the truth. So what is in commercially prepared Depomedrol? Well, it's got methylprednisolone, but it's also got this compound called polyethylene glycol. Does that scare anybody in the room, polyethylene glycol? Anything that ends in OL like that is an alcohol, right? Glycol is an alcohol. How about myristyl gamma picolinium chloride? Try saying that 10 times. That's also a preservative, right? And then we have this. So that's what Depomedrol has, and you probably didn't even know that if I asked you about that earlier. If I asked you to list the composition of methylprednisolone acetate, I think nobody in the room besides myself and Mark Boswell could probably do it, and maybe Dr. Dada. And that's not an indictment against you, you just don't know. These are the things that are in commercially prepared chemicals, right? How about Aristocort? We don't really use it any longer because it's got not only uh, triamcinolone, but polyethylene glycol and benzyl alcohol, and most people are not using it. How many people are using Kenalog? Rick, I'm sorry, but I, I got started late. We were, well, okay. How many people use Kenalog for their epidural steroid injections? Anybody? So what's inside Kenalog commercially prepared? Well, we have triamcinolone acetonine, but we also have benzyl alcohol, almost 1%. That's 10 milligrams per ml, 1% of benzyl alcohol. Does that scare anybody in the room? Okay. Kenalog, how about this drug? This is commercially prepared, dexamethasone sodium phosphate. How many people think that there are chemical preservatives in that? Commercially prepared. What do we have? Well, we have dexamethasone and benzyl alcohol and sodium sulfite and sodium citrate in commercially prepared Decadron. How about this one, Celestone Cyuspan? Any preservatives in that? 
So what do we see here? We see two types of beta methasone, sodium phosphate and acetate. And of course we have dibasic sauce, sodium phosphate, monobasic, editate, disodium, and this thing, benzalkonium chloride. Does benzalkonium chloride ring a bell? Anybody know where you find benzalkonium chloride in your hospital? This is where you find it, in those little towelettes that they use to disinfect the skin because it's an alcohol and a very toxic one at that. Although the concentration is about six times higher of benzalkonium chloride in this preparation than in your commercial steroid being used for injection. Aristospan, anyone use this for epidural injections? And what has Aristospan, triamcinolone, but also it has hydrochloric acid and benzyl alcohol. Woo! These are toxic chemicals, ladies and gentlemen. And so, we know that you can use steroids without preservatives, right? And why do we do that? Well, because about 60 years ago, Margoli showed that propylene glycol in high concentrations could cause serious neurological destructive lesions. Honorio Benzon at Northwestern University, when he was at the Brigham Hospital, actually measured the effects on isolated rabbit sciatic nerve. Uh, he took a paintbrush and took different preparations and concentrations of polyethylene, not propylene, polyethylene glycol, and painted on the, on the nerve, and then measured nerve conduction velocity and found that up to 40% polyethylene glycol was actually pretty safe. So that in the typically used concentrations of our preservatives, we're probably not harming anybody. So let's talk about the history. Well, we started off in the 50s using intrathecal, not epidural steroid injections. We used hydrocortisone for multiple sclerosis. And then Gardner at the Cleveland Clinic was one of the first to inject epidural steroids for managing radiculopathic pain. But Gardner and his associates also used epidural steroid injections for arachnoiditis, for brachialgia, histaminic cephalgia, multiple sclerosis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, pseudotumor cerebri, and other conditions. And so we know that you can find compounding companies which will take out all those toxic chemicals, and so they'll make your steroids safer, or will they? Anyone know about what happened back in the early 2010s? In 2012, we had a fungal meningitis problem in the United States due to the New England Compounding Center in Framingham, Massachusetts. This is in the New England Journal of Medicine, the first case where there was an isolation of Aspergillus fumigatus from an individual who developed meningitis. This is the New England Compounding Center in Framingham. The actual organism identified in the vast majority of cases was Exerthohylum rostratum. And this, there's a picture of a baseball player. Anyone know who that is? Anybody? Anybody name that baseball player? Ricardo, I know you can name that baseball player. Come on, this is Tony Canigliaro, who was the 1967 Rookie of the Year for the Boston Red Sox. And in 1969 or thereabouts, he was struck under the zygoma and lost his vision. Anybody who knows anything about baseball knows that the helmets now cover the area around the face so that you don't injure your eye. And he was a tragic individual, died in his early 50s, had alcohol and drug problems, but he was an incredibly gifted athlete. Now why do I put Canigliaro up with the New England Compounding Center? Because his nephew started the New England Compounding Center, another Gregory Canigliaro. And the Canigliaro family made millions of dollars compounding steroids, especially methylprednisolone acetate. So by February 4th, 2013, these steroids had caused about 700 cases of spinal meningitis. And you can see that there were 696 cases and 45 deaths. Michigan, highly represented, Tennessee, Indiana, et cetera. A few months later, March 25th, 2013, now we had 730 fungal meningitis cases with 51 deaths. Michigan, Tennessee, Indiana, Virginia, New Jersey. Then by October 23rd, 2013, we had 751 fungal meningitis cases with 64 deaths and you can see the states represented. Now, why do I bring this to your attention? Because many of us want to use steroids, whether they're soluble or insoluble, particulate or non-particulate. We want to use steroids that don't have any chemicals inside of them for preservatives. But be very careful when you order from chemical compounding companies. New England Compounding Center was a very reputable company until 2013. So, when we choose our steroids, we base it on inconvenient truths. And the inconvenient truth, and Dr. Glazer touched a little bit about this earlier, was that we tried to place the medication as close as possible to the epicenter of the nociceptive impulses. And so a transforaminal injection comes in from the side and injects medication. See the little red stripe? That's the primordial soup in the epidural compartment where we find histamine, lactate, bradykinin, substance P, calcitonin, gene-related peptide, vasoactive intestinal peptide, and phospholipase A2.
And our goal is to merely neutralize these chemicals. We don't change anything anatomically, and we can use a soluble steroid for that or an insoluble steroid. However, you can also do an interlaminar injection and basically have the same results as transferaminal. Now, Dr. Glazer also pointed out the inconvenient truth about the fact that we have a radiculomedullary artery that sits, in most cases, directly ventral to that nerve root. And so the so-called safe triangle, of course, is not a safe triangle. And if you violate that artery, whether you cause it to go into spasm, whether you cannulate it and inject directly into the artery, whether you get an embolic phenomenon, you could lead to paralysis, stroke, death, or blindness. And so some societies have suggested that transferaminal injections are superior to interlaminar, and I would respectfully disagree. This was a, a paper published in Regional Anesthesia Pain Medicine a few years ago with 317 references, where the author stated categorically, without doing a meta-analysis and without doing a systematic review, that transferaminal injections were somehow more efficacious than interlaminar injections, but they based their premise on a faulty artistic rendering that the transferaminal injection placed the medicine directly over the dorsal root ganglion, whereas the interlaminar injection was far removed. But you can see that interlaminar injections can also be off-center. You can place that needle using a, a, approach, a dorsal approach, not a lateral approach. You can come in and place the, the needle almost directly over the dorsal root ganglion. We call that a parasagittal approach. So what's that got to do with soluble versus insoluble steroids? I'm going to tell you in just a moment. If you look at this safety announcement that came from the United States Food and Drug Administration on April 23, 2014, this should have made you stop treating patients because the FDA said on April 23, 2014, that epidural steroid injections can cause blindness, stroke, paralysis, and death. And they really wanted all of us to tell every patient that we injected that your steroid injection can cause blindness, paralysis, stroke, or death. And as Dr. Glazer also pointed out, in October of 2014, he and I and several others went down to Silver Spring, Maryland to confront the FDA because this was a wrong statement. Now why was it a faulty statement? Because there were 17 references attached to this document. 14 of those references were exclusive to transferaminal injections, not interlaminar injections, not epidural steroid injections that we all do in our respective practices each and every day, transferaminal injections, and we wanted them to amend the language. And so we believed, and myself and Tim Deere and others wrote some letters and were very strongly advocating that they alter their language and that they should change this language to say that transferaminal injections can cause blindness, stroke, paralysis, and death. And why is that? Well, because of that radiculomedullary artery. And you can get to that epidural space without using a transferaminal approach. Now, we know that transferaminal injections can cause blindness, stroke, paralysis, and death. And as Dr. Glazer pointed out, we don't know if it's due to embolization, if it's due to vascular trespass, if it's due to vascular cannulation. We just know that patients can get paralyzed from transferaminal injections. And we know from Rick Tizo's seminal work, after he paralyzed a patient and went back and looked at the size of steroids, that there are some steroids that are going to clog up arteries and arterioles. And so the, the multidisciplinary working group in about 2011 or so said, hey, we can prevent this. We can use this thing called digital subtraction angiography. How many people in the audience regularly use DSA or cine angiography? Three people. Well, we looked at this and found that, that not only is DSA, in my humble opinion, worthless, costs a lot of money, exposes you and your patients and your x-ray techs to enormous quantities of ionizing radiation. We found that it did not reliably prevent paraplegia. How? Well, here's a case from Northwestern University, a great hospital in Chicago, where a 79-year-old patient came in for a transferaminal injection and never walked again. And they used digital subtraction angiography, and they used extension tubing, and they did a test dose, and they used a particulate or insoluble steroid known as triamcinolone acetonide. This is the DSA images, and this is the MRI showing a massive infarct that occurred instantaneously after an L5-S1 transferaminal injection where DSA was used and particulate steroids were injected. And the patient infarcted his spinal cord from T7 all the way down to the base of the spine, never walked again. Another case happened in Chicago at another major teaching institution where they paid out $2.3 million uh, using, again, a transferaminal approach and particulate steroids. And this happens all over the country. We know that. 
So not just in the cervical spine, but also in the lumbar spine. And so uh, George Chang Chen and I were very opinionated and said, wait a minute, you know, DSA is not the answer. In fact, we did a meta-analysis and a systematic review of all 383 papers up to that time which had ever looked at DSA and the success rate of identifying arterial trespass. And you guess what? You can see venous trespass pretty well with DSA, but not arterial. And you can't differentiate venous from arterial. So I humbly ask you to put aside the misconception that you're safe by using digital subtraction angiography. So are there alternatives to transframinal injections? And I, again, humbly submit to you that you can do an interlaminar injection and have basically the identical results as transframinal. We studied this, we published this, uh, along with Andrea Trescott, Zach McCormick, myself, and several other investigators and pain physician in 2015. And we looked at all the studies up to that point, all the patients that had been studied with head-to-head -head comparisons between transframinal and interlaminar injections and found no difference in pain relief no difference in functionality. Our conclusions were that there's no clinically significant difference in efficacy for pain relief or functional improvement whether you give your patient a transframinal injection or an interlaminar injection. Other investigators have found exactly the same thing. Babita Guy published several papers in anesthesia, analgesia, and pain physician finding exactly the same thing, updating our study several years later with the newer studies that had accrued. So, all interlaminar injections are not created equal, and we studied actually a trans, uh, sorry, an interlaminar midline injection versus a parasagittal or off midline injection, and we, we studied it in more than 100 patients. It was prospective randomized control double blinded. We followed patients up for one year. We found that the parasagittal or off midline interlaminar injection reduced pain, reduced narcotics consumption, and improve functionality in the vast majority of parasagittal patients to a greater degree, statistically and clinically significant, than in those who had undergone conventional midline injections. Only 4% of our patients at one year, one out of 25 patients, only 4% of our patients went on to a surgical intervention in that one year time. Now that's important, because my topic today is, is soluble versus insoluble steroids or particulate versus non-particulate. So I bring you to another study by some great investigators, DJ Kennedy, look at the names here, Chris Plasteris, Paul Dreyfus, a lot of the people who work in the Spine Injection Society. After our paper was published, they looked at transframinal injections using either particulate steroids, triamcinolone, or non-particulate steroids, dexamethasone. And I draw your attention to this study because it's very important. So 15% of the patients who got dexamethasone went on to surgery within the six months of this observation period. They got 12 milligrams of dexamethasone, they went on to surgery. 19% of patients who got triamcinolone went on to surgery. I don't know about you and your respective practice, do one out of five of your patients who come in for epidural injections ultimately go to surgery, Dr. Hansen? It's a Absolutely. big number. Absolutely, it's North Carolina. It's North Carolina. So that's a big number. 20% of your patients, one out of five going to surgery. I don't know where these numbers came from. But more impressive still, and Dr. Glazer touched on this, Decadron doesn't last. And so you can see that on the bottom, it's highlighted in red on bold. The number of patients requiring multiple injections, three injections in this case, was seven times higher in the dexamethasone group than in the triamcinolone group. Meaning that if you gave your patient a Decadron injection, transframinal, they came back to you not once, they came back to you not twice, but they came back to you three times for the same injection compared to the particulate steroids. So this is a great piece of evidence that the non-particulate, the soluble steroid dexamethasone doesn't last. It may lead to similar outcomes as the particulate steroids, but it doesn't last. So let's conclude. We know, or at least we suspect, that the non-particulate or the soluble steroid in, uh, use is somewhat safer than particulate steroid. The vast majority of cases, but not all, Chris Garibo in New York actually has a, one case of a decadron-induced uh, infarction or, or paralysis using um, a transframinal technique um, compared to um, the insoluble or the particulate steroids. But we believe that dexamethasone is probably a safer alternative to the, the insoluble steroids like methylprednisolone or triamcinolone. However, and this was in the first attempt at a meta-analysis to actually look at the results, and you can see this was published first in November of 2016 by a group of PM&R physicians. They found that there's no 
evidence determining whether or not triamcinolone and methylprednisolone are superior, inferior, or identical to dexamethasone. They published again their updated report later in that year and found again uh, that there's no uh, proposed difference between soluble and insoluble steroids. Their recommendation is, is that we use soluble or non-particulate steroids for interlaminar injections. I respectfully disagree with that. I respectfully disagree because clinically and in published studies, I see superiority of the insoluble steroids, the methylprednisolones and the triamcinolones with the drugs like dexamethasone. Now there's also a case of uh, quadriplegia after a lumbar transfeminal injection using dexamethasone, but it was transient. And I told you that Dr. Garibo has a one single case in New York City of a patient with a paralysis issue or paraplegia issue following a transfeminal dexamethasone injection. So why do we have a concern about soluble versus insoluble steroids? Because we know that transfeminal injections are ever increasing on an exponential basis compared to interlaminar injections. Well, why should that worry us? After all, our po patient population is aging. Because if you look at the costs associated with transferaminal injections, they're about 150% of interlaminar injections. So the insurance companies are paying careful attention to this. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about Medicare dollars, Medicaid dollars, Blue Cross, United Healthcare, or any of the major insurers. It costs a lot more to do a transferaminal injection than an interlaminar injection. And you can see that the spending for all types of injections goes into the many billions of dollars. So we've got to have cost containment in addition to safety and efficacy always at the forefront of our decision making. So each of the approaches, meaning transferaminal, interlaminar, soluble and insoluble steroids has benefits in select patients. Vascular compromise, whether it's due to embolism, whether it's due to infarction, whether it's due to just vasospasm. We don't know, as Dr. Glazer pointed out. That's the Achilles heel of all the transferaminal techniques. And remember that interlaminar injections, you may not get reimbursed as robustly as you would for transferaminal, but they are, without any question whatsoever, they are a suitable alternative to transferaminal injections if you use a parasagittal approach. So I thank you for your time, and I thank you for your attention. Have a great afternoon. Okay, there are some questions. Do I have time for any questions? Dr. Buenaventura. Yes. Go ahead, please. Question in the back, gentleman with glasses. Yes, sir. Uh, do you do cervical I do not do cervical transfemoral injections any longer. I've done them. I, I, when I did them, I did them primarily for diagnostic, not for therapeutic purposes. So I would typically inject local anesthetic. Uh, where a neurosurgeon might ask me, I'm not sure if this is a C5 or a C6 nerve root issue, would you kindly try to identify the offending nerve root? I realize the fallacy of trying to use very small aliquots of local anesthetic to get an isolated nerve root, um, because all that medication is going to be absorbed into the epidural space and spread from multi-segments, even if you use a quarter or an eighth of a cc. It was totally a fraudulent concept, so I, I aborted that process. I probably did several steroid injections, but I haven't done any in at least 10 years in the cervical spine. When you did them, what steroids? I used Depomedrol. I used Depomedrol up until probably 2010. For all my cervical transfer, I did not use Decadron. I thought Decadron was a very poor choice. If you were still doing them today, what would you use? Dexamethasone, but preservative-free. I have a, We have 10 milligram per ml concentration in my practice, which is preservative-free. That would be what I would, I would select. Question. You, sir. If, yes. If you have a large disc in the foramen, would you modify your technique from an intraneural approach or consider a supraneural approach? If that... I would never consider a supraneural approach because of the anatomical okay. construct. And, and you know, if there's an anthropomorphic distribution of anatomical variables in all humans, meaning that there's going to be a variability where we find certain structures, but I will tell you. And I will guarantee you that that artery is almost always going to be superior and, me and medial to the exiting spinal nerve root. And I don't want to, this, these are elective procedures. These are all elective procedures. There's nothing life-saving about injecting somebody with a corticosteroid in their spine, cervical, thoracic, or lumbar. And as such, because it's a purely elective procedure, first do no harm. Primum non nocere has to be the principle upon which we practice and which we, uh, we make all of our clinical decisions. So just because it may seem logical to avoid that disc, and as Dr. Glazer pointed out, even if I get intradiscal, I'm not going to really cause much, much morbidity to a patient. I'd rather be intradiscal than intraarterial.
questions? Yes. One last one. So, I mean, an intralaminar approach typically, you know, versus a single level transfer ramen, I'm using about four times as much steroid. They use to look at 80 milligrams um, for an intralaminar epidural versus this, you know, single level transfer ramen. 80 milligrams of methylprednisolone? Or? Okay, so then you're only using what, 20 milligrams for a transferaminal injection? Yeah, about 20 if I'm doing a single level. Yeah. So you're not using dexamethasone? Well, I'm talking about lumbar here, not, not steroid. Okay. But, um, I mean, doesn't that steroid dose kind of affect you? Not at all. The, the, dose is, the dose is three milligrams per kilogram per week. Those are systemic doses. So if you've got the average 70 kilogram person, uh, that's three, uh, 70 times three, 210 milligrams. 80 milligrams is about one third of where you would be where you have any con concerns whatsoever. So I think that that justification, quite frankly, doesn't really carry a lot of weight. And if you use a parasagittal approach, you can use very discrete volumes, much lower volumes of your injectate, your steroid, and any ancillary medication, local anesthetic or saline, and effectively get exactly the same spread I've done interlaminar injections and gotten four, five, six nerve roots, taking a far parasagittal approach and injecting four or five cc's. So I, I don't ascribe to that respectfully. Yes, sir, in the back. Can you comment on using a high volume model, like 20 ml? So that's a great question. Obviously the caudal epidural space is a very capacious, large volume space. Phil Bromage, who's published the, the first treatise on epidural analgesia in 1978, said that the average epidural caudal space holds about 25 mLs. So if you, the issue is relates to dilution of your steroid. So if you're gonna put 80 milligrams of Depomedrol in 20 cc's, that's four milligrams per mL. I don't really know what benefit that is versus what the other gentleman said, putting a much more concentrated, targeted dose at the affected site of nociception. I think that diluting your medication into 20 mLs may be fundamentally interesting. You'll spread up to L2, L3, and maybe get multiple segmental nerve roots, but you're diluting your effective medication. And we don't know what the optimal concentration is at the target, right? We don't know whether you need 10 milligrams per mL or 40 milligrams per mL, but I think when you get down to two or four milligrams per mL, that's probably too little. That's like putting water in the space. Now, Dr. Manchikanti and others have said that saline itself is an effective analgesic. It's not inert. So maybe there's maybe what I'm saying is just based on hypotheticals and conjecture and speculation. But I like to put a, a larger slug of medicine over the bad guy and see if that works before I, I dilute it that much. Thank you. Oh, yes, sir, Dr. Boswell. Thank you. So we're dealing with a lot of patients now that have all had surgery. Yes, sir. All the way down to Correct. So now it's very good. You can't do interlaminars. Correct. You're stuck with either transparamyl or caudal problem. What about S1 and you know putting sharp needles in S1 for anyone? Well, I, I don't ascribe to putting a sharp needle anywhere for any transfer.